it's going to work. Let's see. Okay. So, getting to a more philosophical approach away from dynamic systems. Here we're looking at a more sort of broadly conceptual issue about how we ought to approach the mind or cognition. And echoing um, Monty Python, you might say, well, look, what do the embodied embedded approaches to the mind do for us? What have they ever done for us? Um, well, what it does is it definitely provides a way of attacking a more traditionally Cartesian-influenced internalism or individualism about the mind. That idea that the mind is distinct from the rest of the world, importantly distinct in, onto in an ontological sense, in an epistemic sense, that's why you need representations and so on. So it's against this sort of idea that cognitive systems, minds, agents, end at the skin. Um, and consequently, it, sh it ought to have some sort of influence on grounding assumptions in things like philosophy of mind and cognition, psychology and the cognitive sciences broadly. So what it does is it denies that cognitive or mental states and processes must be constituted solely by neural states or processes. So it's going to deny a mind-brain supervenience or identity claim. So in other words, there may be aspects of the mind that are strictly supervene on the brain, potentially, but not all of them. Some cognitive states and processes are going to um, extend in that sense beyond simply the brain, to include the body and the body in an environment. So that would be a kind of conceptual encapsulation of those um, claims from the dynamical sciences, right, or from the dynamical systems people, which is that you would have interacting variables from both agent and environment. It's going to spend a lot more time than a more traditional uh, internalist, individualist cognitive science looking at the way that cognition involves bodily interaction with the world. It's going to spend a lot more time investigating the kind of things that roboticists, for example, are interested in, in which case it becomes, in a sense, a bit more of a bottom-up kind of science, if you want to put it that way. And so that has a knock-on effect not just for the conception of mind, but also potentially for methodology. So in other words, it's, uh, it's suggesting that we shouldn't think that minds are exclusively about intellectual or contentful states that represent reality and drive behavior. That cognition may well be driven by mechanisms that do not operate on the basis strictly of rationalized contents uh, that are held in propositional or linguistic form somewhere in the brain. Of course, you can already see that there are lots of neuroscientists who are going to agree with that. We can go further than that and begin to look at the way that the brain, the body, and the world all act together in concert by interacting on one another. Making the mind environmentally constituted. Right. In other words, we're just denying that that picture that I started with is an actual, ac accurate picture of the way that things actually are. That there is no deep split between mind and world. And that ought to have a knock-on effect for epistemology. If any of you have done epistemology or read any epistemology, if you've looked at Descartes' meditations, for example, You'll know that the, the problem, the philosophical problem there is skepticism. How do we know, right? So sometimes people put this forward as a kind of joke conception of philosophy. How do we know that there is a real world? Right? You put it like that, it sounds like a silly question. The question is actually motivated by this kind of picture of reality. It's motivated by the idea that minds are supposed to reflect the external world. How do they do that? Right? Because they're distinct, they're split. So we, we're constantly thinking about how the environment causes us to perceive it, or how um, we have 
beliefs about the environment that may true or false by it. Right? Those kind of claims. So if you don't think that there's really that big a split between them, then those kind of problems don't become so obviously metaphysical or ontological problems. And that might well be because actually a lot of our behavior is a bit more like cockroach behavior with regard to the world. We don't actually physically move around the world, get to do things like reaching for um, this bottle because there are states with contents, contents like there is a bottle over there that are driving behavior or representing reality in any interesting sense. The explanation of that would be much more low level. Let me push it uh, to a, a more obviously high level cognitive phenomenon. Uh, most of us will have had the horror of learning mathematics at school. Um, <coughs> long multiplication. You learn multi you, there are all kinds of ways for learning long multiplication, but you learn usually learn at some stage something like the partial products algorithm. Uh, if you're asked to multiply 3,477 by 7,542, Maybe one of you can do it, but it's quite rare to be able to just do it in your head. If you write the numbers down in the normal fashion of one above the other, and you apply the partial products algorithm to those numbers, then you can quite easily, even though you can't, in your head, as it were, come up with the answer, you can quite easily come up with the answer if you know how to do it. So the complex multiplication can be broken down into simpler ones using paper to store the intermediate stages of the calculation. So this is sort of um, Bechtel's point in the paper on connectionism in the section on the brain and connectionism, the, the section of the course. So it's really this idea that actually we don't need to think that all of the structure and all of the operations that count to producing the right behavior or solving a cognitive task need to be in the head. Some of them might loop through the environment. And then something more like the dynamical systems approach is going to be better positioned to explain that than a strictly internal approach. So this has led some people, notably Andy Clark and David Chalmers back in 1998, in a by now classic paper. Uh, Andy Clark is, uh, holds the Chair of Logic and Metaphysics at the University of Edinburgh. There's probably no one <laughs> less likely to engage in those two things than him. I mean, he is a, he, he's a philosopher who is in a, much more of an empirical philosophy. He's worked in cognitive science departments, and he worked in the philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience um, program at the University of Washington. He actually ran it, um, and it, most of his books are about connectionism or about uh, embodied cognition, so not really a straightforward um, philosopher in that sense. Dave Chalmer, by contrast, is a professor at ANU. A lot of his work is on consciousness, and he's actually a dualist. He thinks that consciousness is non-physical, at least in some primary sense. But nevertheless, anyway, at some point they worked on this together. Um, and they are motivated by a lot of, well, Andy certainly is motivated by a lot of the kind of moves that were made by the dynamical guys in the, especially in the early 90s. And here's a sort of um, philosophical encapsulation of just that aspect of dynamical systems, a coupled system idea that I was talking about earlier. So in cases like, like the case of log multiplication, the human organism is linked with an external entity in a two-way interaction, creating a coupled system that can be seen as a cognitive system in its own right. So remember, you take those two variables and you make them part of a wider system. So of course there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on in the brain when we're doing long multiplication on, with pen and paper. But there's also interesting stuff that is uh, important <coughs> to the completion of the task, to the production of behavior, 
that um, is going on in the environment as well. Here's another um, quote from that paper, which is also part of reading, one of the readings. It's a very easy paper to read, actually, I think. In all these cases, the individual brain performs some operations, right, contains some of the dynamical variables, while others are delegated to manipulations of external media. Another sort of simple way of putting that in, in the case we've been looking at is writing, right? Um, had our brains been different, this distribution of tasks would doubtless have varied. So if our brains were, were different, if, for example, we had a kind of mathematics module in the brain, then we would just do it, right? We would just do 3,477 multiplied by whatever it was. I mean, we've got it now, another limitation in the brain, short-term memory. Um, we would just do it. If there was a module there that could just do those computations simply, then we wouldn't need to resort to pen and paper. But we do need to resort to pen and paper. Is there an inference we can make from that? Well, this is an example of how you would make that kind of inference. So here's Andy Clark and Dave Chalmers. Um, Actually, in Sydney, uh, uh, there was a conference a while ago uh, organized by John Sutton, who's professor of cognitive science here uh, at Macquarie. That's actually at um, uh, Woolloomooloo on the wharf there. There's a restaurant called Otto. And you'll see why Otto is important to these guys in a, mit in a minute. But they reached a, a conclusion in that paper which um, echoes um, a conclusion that was re reached by another philosopher called Hilary Putnam uh, about 20 years earlier than that. His cognitive processes ain't all in the head. Right? Uh, some of them might be, but not all of them. Uh, Andy Clark, by the way, is the one with the colourful shirt on, and Dave Chalmers is the one with the long hair and the yellow t-shirt. Colourfully, colourfully clobbered duo. So Putnam's conclusion was that meanings ain't all in the head. So he had already done a lot of work on what came to be known as externalism, on trying to show that um, the meanings of words, for example, couldn't be determined exclusively by what was in the head of an individual. In a sense, that just seems pretty obvious, but it's not obvious to everyone. So some other, some, here's, a, here's some actual empirical work which was also done in the 90s and has been a continuing process by um, two <coughs> psychologists, David Kirsch and Paul Maglio, on what they called epistemic actions. So this is quite nice um, stuff uh, that they did. Uh, it's, uh, it's nice to go and read that original paper and it's, uh, it, it, it's not a philosophy paper. So they talk about experiments. Um, the paper from 1994 in Cognitive Science is called Distinguishing, On Distinguishing Epistemic from Pragmatic Actions. So they distinguish pragmatic actions as things like getting a full stomach. Uh, epistemic actions are actions that are aimed at achieving a cognitive goal like solving a problem by directly manipulating the environment. So in other words, what they're talking about, I mean, what kind of objection to the position that Clark and Chalmers are taking. And you'll see these kind of objections if you go and look at the wider li literature. Yeah, but these are just actions or behavior. And they're, of course, caused by neural operations or cognitive states and processes in the head. So they're not cognitive. They're the outputs of cognition. So how could you count them as being part of cognitive processing? That just looks like a category mistake, as some philosophers would say. Well, here's an example of how we might get around that. Some actions are just obviously about, I'm thirsty, I reach for the bottle, unscrew the lid and bring it to my lips. There's behavior there, it looks pragmatic. It's caused, presumably, at least on this model, by internal states, perhaps contemporal ones that drive the machine. But here, Kirsch and Maglio are suggesting that there's a class of actions that aren't like that. 
They're sort of mediating actions. So they're the kind of actions that help us to solve a genuinely cognitive goal by actually physically reorganizing the environment in some way. So they're not just simple outputs of behavior in an obvious sense. <coughs> Behavioral outputs, I might say better. So here's an example. It's Tetris. Right. So experienced Tetris players rotate shapes called zoids as soon as they appear uh, to visually see where they fit best. Right. So there's an example of what Tetris looks like. So they move these shapes around, they rotate them, they line them up, uh, move them across the screen. Uh, now the point that Kirsch and Maglio say, put forward here is that these rotations, the actions, are not directly tied to the goal. So they're not pragmatic actions in that sense, they suggest. But they alter the task space so as to make reaching the goal easier or more achievable. So they're sort of intermediate or mediating actions or stages of the problem-solving task in between, taking the sort of traditional model, input and output. That means that the actions are doing a slightly different job here. These are examples of the kind of movements that they're talking about. So rather than just slotting it straight into the gap there, there are all these kinds of intermediate moves that are made, rotations or moving things to the wall and then moving them back to make sure that it's lined up correctly. And these are altering the task structure. They're altering the task space in which tasks are completed. So these kinds of examples, examples like epistemic actions, which uh, feature quite um, heavily in the Extended Mind paper of Clark and Chalmers, the general dynamical li literature, the idea of a coupled system, these are the sort of things that are motivating the idea that actually cognition is about um, human organisms interacting with their environments, such that those interactions that loop out into the environment are part of the processing, part of the cognitive processing. They're part of the resources that lead to the um, augmented or potentially completely distinct forms of behavior. So remember the mole cricket. The mole cricket and its burrow interact in such a way that it can produce behavior that it wouldn't otherwise be able to produce. Or it augments that behavior in a way that it otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Well, since it's supposed to be about cognition, what kind of conditions or what kind of criteria might we able to be able to produce for these kinds of instances? Well, here are some uh, examples taken from the paper of Clark and Chalmers. All the components play some kind of active causal role. They're not simply just sitting there. They're dynamical. They jointly govern behavior in the same sort of way that cognition does. So we generally have an idea about how cognition is supposed to produce behavior. Well, here we can see the same kind of thing happening. It's just that there are some of the cognitive variables are not internal. If we remove the external component, then behavioral competence would drop. If I remove the pen and paper from you, your behavioral competence with regard to doing long multiplication is going to drop. The mole cricket can't make the loud sounds anymore. So it's in this sense that external features of a coupled system play in an ineliminable role. If you remove one of them, you no longer get the dense coupled interactions and you don't get the interesting behaviors. That's the, the uh, moral from dynamical systems. So this is just echoing that kind of moral. And this is just, um, I'm just reminding you of the slide where we made that kind of conclusion that from earlier on. I won't read it out, but this is the idea that the cognitive unit is an unfolding dynamical system, and the global behavior of the system is a product of the internal and external processes interacting and working in concert. If you remove either of them, you no longer get the interesting behaviors. Now, here's a point I just want to make um, uh, happy clapping for 
what we might call the externalists so far, but let me just say something on behalf of the internist. But hang on a minute, um, an internist might say. Surely, if you remove the environmental variables, you still get some kind of behavior out of the system. So if I don't allow you to do the um, the multiplication by using pen and paper, you might be able to visualize it, or you might be able to guess. You might just have, ah, I reckon it'd be something like. So you'd still be able to produce some sort of behavior. It's not as if suddenly the system can't behave at all. The same way that the mole cricket can still produce a song, even if it doesn't have the borrow to amplify it. So it's not clear that the environment is doing anything really, really that fundamental here. It's not as if there are behaviors that without the environment you just couldn't behave at all. You wouldn't get anything. Even in the kind of Tetris epistemic action example, if you stop Tetris players from doing those moves, their competence would drop, no doubt, but they'd still be able to do it, right? So I think there's a, there's a serious point there that needs to be addressed. Let's, I don't, I'm not a thought experiment style philosopher, but this is part of the um, uh, famous paper, so we should address it. And actually the thought experiment kind of gives an answer to that kind of issue that I've just raised. Here's the thought experiment. This is the infamous or famous, depending on your view, Otto case of extended memory. So <coughs> in this thought experiment, uh, Otto is a, um, a character with dementia or onset of amnesia or some other kind of memory problem of that kind. He relies on a notebook. In that notebook, he writes down all kinds of information that is important and useful to his life. And when he wants to remember something, because he can't recall it from biological memory, he consults his notebook. If you took the notebook away from him, he wouldn't remember. Right. So that's a different case from that the internalist has just been complaining about. Right. So here's the example. Uh, Otto is um, told that there's a cool Rothko exhibition on at the Museum of Modern Art. He opens up his notebook, and he finds out that Mama is on 53rd Street, and off he goes to 53rd Street and enjoys the cool Rothko exhibition. Right. Assuming you think Rothko is cool, which you may not. Anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there. Another character, Inga. Inga has normal biological memory, let's say. She, of course, has all the limitations that those of us with biological memory, per se, have uh, bouts of not being able to remember things due to too much imbibing of alcohol and things like that. Um, but Inga hears that the same ex Rothko exhibition is on at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and she retrieves the location of the Museum of Modern Art as being on 53rd Street, and off she toddles to 53rd Street and enjoys the exhibition. Now, Clark and Chalmers make a quite strong claim, right, which is in this next bullet point, that uh, to actually understand the role, and here they're talking about causal role, played by Otto's deployment of the information in his notebook and Inga's pattern of activation in her brain, the physical implementation of the causal role is irrelevant. So what they're claiming is that Otto's manipulation of his notebook and Inga's retrieval of information from somewhere stored in a neural network in a brain um, is causally equivalent, even though it's implementationally distinct. So obviously, physically, the notebook and, the, and, and brains just aren't alike. Right? They're very different. But at some sort of higher order causal level, they can produce the same kinds of behaviors. So they're equivalent. If that moral follows, then the two cases seem to be on a par. They have parity. They fall under the same kind of functional or causal description. So there's a, a photograph of Leonard from the uh, Christopher Nolan's film 
memento. If you haven't seen it, go and see it. It's, uh, it's a nice kind of illustration of some of the issues of, about the extended mind. In fact, um, Clark has written a paper called Memento's Revenge. So that kind of, that's a thought experiment, right? So it's not a real world example, it's a thought experiment. Actually, um, there are real world examples of Ottos. Um, one of the ways in which clinicians get people with brain damage, dementia, strokes, and so on, to be able to reconstruct their lives, because they can no longer retain information, they can't remember things, is to use memory notebooks. So you can actually go off and read actual clinical examples of this. They're highly um, structured to um, give information that is important and relevant to everyday activities. And so people just become highly dependent upon them. And these activities of writing information in and retrieving it become automatized and proceduralized. And part of the clinical training is to get it automated. So you don't think about it all the time. You're just doing it. So it becomes more like that sort of automatic retrieval of, mem of a memory. Uh, there's a sort of objection that runs around here that the retrieval of memory um, uh, into consciousness that Inga goes through is going to be different from the retrieval of information from a notebook. Right? One, of it, one of it is effortless. The other one is um, requires you to open the book, gain perceptual input, interpret that input, and so on. So it looks like a different kind of process. Um, I think there's several things to say about that. I mean, the first is no one's claiming the processes have to be identical. The idea is an idea of equivalence. Um, the second is that actually the cases of biological memory are not so obviously straightforward as is often made out in the literature. So you could easily imagine that Inga would say, oh, great, um, there's a Rothko exhibition on at MoMA. Where's MoMA again? 53rd Street. I'm not sure. Maybe it's 52nd Street. I better go and check Google Maps. Right? You can imagine that as an everyday process. It happens to all of us all the time, I imagine, in similar circumstances. So what we recall from memory isn't always automatically endorsed. Right? Memory is quite fragmented. Um, we remember bits of things. We don't remember everything veridically. No one's going to make that kind of stupid claim. So actually, the idea that memory would just be this immediate retrieval and action kind of story is not so obvious. Uh, in fact, it's just false. I think I can, I think I can get away with that. Um, here's sort of criteria that um, Clark and Chalmers and Clark in other places have given for how we ought to think of Otto as an extended memory system here, or an extended cognitive system. Well, first of all, the resource has got to be reliably available. We carry our brains around with us everywhere. We could leave our notebook down the back of the sofa, which some people think would lead you to make kind of strange claims like, my memories, I lost my memory down the back of a sofa. And that's a sort of odd thing to say. Um, but anyway, the resource is reliably available and typically invoked. Otto always carries a notebook and won't answer that he doesn't know until after he's consulted it. Any information thus retrieved be more or less automatically endorsed. It should not usually be subject to critical scrutiny, unlike the opinions of other people, for example. It should be deemed about as trustworthy worthy as something retrieved clearly from biological memory. And it doesn't follow that the same kind of conscious concerns or doubts about whether or not you remember things correctly have to follow for the notebook case. I think that's something you could profitably um, talk about in tutorials. Information contained in the resource should be easily accessible um, as and when required. So this leads them to make a statement which has become known as, uh, it's not in, they don't call it this in, in, in the uh, paper, it's become known as the parity principle. So this is a parity principle, it's a bit of a mouthful, but anyway, it, it really just is supposed to encapsulate in general terms this point that I've just developed about the parity of causal role of Otto and Inga. Right? If as we confront some task, a part of the world functions as a process, which, 
Were it done in the head, we would have no hesitation in recognizing as part of the cognitive process. Then that part of the world is part of the cognitive process. So let's break that down a bit. If this external process were located in the skull, in the brain, we call it cognitive. Therefore, even though it isn't in the head, we all call it cognitive. That's a point that's being made. It does something that is recognizably cognitive. It just happens not to be internal. So what? So the idea here is that we should give up on some sort of internalism or muralist type chauvinism. And we should allow that actually our cognition loops into the world involves um, bodily manipulation and activity in the environment as well. So the parity principle is stated as kind of intuition pump, um, or Clark has more recently called it a veil of metabolic ignorance. I'm not totally sure what he means there. But uh, I think what he's after is look, drop away all your Cartesian prejudices. Drop away all your kind of common sense, supposedly commonsensical objections that the mind must be in the head. And just look at the actual cases. Apply the criteria to them. And then tell me why they're not cognitive. OK, so that's the question at the end. Um, now, there's one way of thinking about this which looks problematic. Except, so some people have sort of taken this up and thought, it looks like a sort of problem with this formulation, right? Which is it looks like it's just taking something that's already in the head and then sticking it out in the world, right? So the parity principle implies the relevant similarity of the external with the internal, where the internal appears to take precedence. So here's a more recent way that Clark has put it. The right kind of coupling to make the resource into a part of the cognitive system, we argued, was one that poised the information contained in the notebook for sufficiently easy, reliable, and automatic deployment in much the same way as it is typically, though not always, achieved by biological encoding. So the idea is that biological encoding of memories is non-controversially cognitive. If... <coughs> Um, the, the function of Otto manipulating his notebook um, is equivalent to that biological encoding, similar enough to it, or has some sort of parity, um, then we ought to count it as being uh, cognitive. But some people are worried that that begins to make it look like what we're doing is saying, we need to understand cognition as, first of all, internal, and then look at bits of the world and see whether they're like that or not. One reaction to that is yuck. That's a, that sounds like a bad move. Do you remember, part of the motivation for all this was to say, well, it's just internalism is already just wrong. So it's a bad starting point to think of um, cognition as primarily being something that goes on in the head. If you drop away that assumption, you don't need a parity principle because you already accept that if cognition is a kind of dynamical system, that dynamical systems are often coupled systems of the kind that we talked about earlier. Those seem to be rife in nature, in which case it ought to be too much of a stretch if you can start from that position to think that um, our bodily interactions with the world are going to be part of our cognitive profile as well as whatever is going on in the head. And that gets us away from this sort of starting assumption which drives a lot of argument, which is that um, we're already formed cognitive agents. Before we um, meet the world in any interesting sense, we're already uh, cognitive agents that could function independently of that world. OK. So the first sort of um, what John Sutton has called first wave of extended mind arguments are these sort of arguments that look at um, 
parity or uh, functional role. And they say things like, look, if external processes play the same role as internal ones, then external processes are on the par with internal ones. Well, look at Otto's notebook. That plays the right kind of role. It's on a par with Inger's internal processes. So Otto's notebook is on a par with internal processes and ought to be considered cognitive. Right. Coming to the end now. So the second wave of uh, extended mind arguments, as John Sutton puts it, take a thing slightly different. They just don't bother with this issue of parity, per se. They certainly agree that we need to have some sort of account of um, causal or functional role. But that's what dynamical systems give us, right? So that's our account of causation. But um, what, we, what we start with is the position of a situated or environmentally embedded um, cognitive agent that is constantly interacting with its environment. When it thinks, it thinks through interactions with its environment. It's not solipsistically bracketed off from its environment. Right. So, in that sense, cognitive processes are hybrid. They involve things like epistemic actions, for example, as well as dynamical spreading of activation across neural networks. And so the external operations can take the form of manipulation, exploitation, transformation of environmental structures, like notebooks, for example, ones that might carry information relevant to the accomplishment of a given task. And at least some of the internal processes are ones concerned with supplying the subject with the ability to appropriately use relevant structures in the environment. But those kinds of internal processes might be like the internal processes that get Big Dog to stop itself from slipping on the ice, rather than thinking of that as a bunch of intellectualized internal representations with contents. We think of it more like the Brooksian, Big Dogian <laughs> type examples where you're going from the bottom up. So these would be proceduralized activities, just as the clinicians try to get the uh, dementia patients to deploy their uh, memory notebooks in a proceduralized way. Right? They get them to write information in and retract it without thinking about that process. So we may not have to think of the internal as being like Fodor thinks it is, for example, like the representational theory of mind thinks it is. At least anyway for these kinds of situations of coupled systems. So I think here um, there are, it's a sort of branch point. You can go a variety of different ways at this point. Um, here's a way of thinking about some of the ways you can branch off. And uh, the other paper for this week is a, a way of showing you how to get really anti-representational from dynamical systems. So just take a more sort of, just say, start from the position that cognitive agents are embodied. They've got bodies, and those bodies interact with environments, and that can be understood in terms of these dynamical inter interactions. What follows from that? Well, one is just a sort of, uh, on, on uh, when you look at it, it looks like the right-hand side to me, but I hope that will be the same for you. The dependent side, let's, let's say. The dependent side, which is saying, well, look, yeah, you know, of course cognition and the mind depends upon the body, and it depends upon the body doing things in the environment, right? But that doesn't mean that the mind isn't still in the head. Nothing seems to dramatically follow just from that claim. Everyone thinks that brains are in bodies, even Fodor and Stitch think that. <coughs> Here's a more... Um, radical idea, some, we'll call it a constitutive claim. The constitutive claim is that being a body in an environment is partly constitutive of what it is to be a cognitive agent. So it's not just that the cognitive system, the brain, is in a body which is in an environment. It's that the cognitive system should be understood as having separate uh, but interacting components. Brains, physical organs, bodies, and environments. And then you've got, you can break that down into different ways. So you could just take that to be a sort of non-individualistic conclusion about cognition. You could potentially still hold to some form of representations. Maybe a lot of what the cognitive system does or the brain does is it absorbs information and represents it. 
So there may still be um, something for the representational theory of mind to do. The other way to go, which is the way that Tony Chimero goes in the, in the second paper for um, the reading this week, is anti-representational. He follows Brooks. The, mind, uh, the world is its own best representation. We don't need to represent it to do cool stuff. Cockroaches get to be clever, or at least they get to do adaptive, interesting behaviors, not because they represent the world. So maybe most, all cognition is like that. It's just cockroach behavior scaled up, big dog scaled up. Now, of course, a lot of people think that conclusion can't follow, but that would be a more radical move to go. And the, the chapter, the Chimera chapter, is from a book called Radical Embodied uh, Cognitive Science. So, um, radical embodied mind thing. Anyway, here's, a, here's then mind as embedded, right? Mind as in embedded in environment. Again, you might just have a dependence view. Of course we're in an environment, and of course the environment sort of matters for the inputs we get and the outputs we get. But nothing follows from that. The mind's still in the head. Right? That's a very weak interpretation. Here's a stronger interpretation. Right. First one is what we might call extended mind, the constitutive um, one, which is that, well, out of the sort of auto examples, um, the examples of Tetris, um, our cognitive resources are extended by these interactions with the environment. So part of our cognitive resources include those interactions with the environment, in which case parts of the environment are also parts of our mind. Um, the other one is to go perhaps even more radically, is to say that the mind just isn't in the head at all. 